start. Okay, yeah. good afternoon, everybody from outside of New York City. I'm Evan Weiner. <laughs> good afternoon. Uh, I would love to be with you, but uh, unfortunately, we're fighting a pandemic right now. But uh, this talk actually was sort of inspired by a guy by the name of Robert Lipsight. I don't know if you know who Robert Lipsight is. Uh, he worked for the New York Times, and he was on PBS, hosted shows on PBS. And uh, Howard Cosell introduced me to Robert Lipsight, and Lipsight was telling me a story which I will incorporate into this talk about Florida and how Florida was the most unlikely place you would have found in the 1960s where cultures changed. And that's where I got the idea from was uh, Lipsight because Lipsight was... Uh, well, I'll tell you in a couple of minutes, because let's go through the background, because that's Miami. And a lot of Florida, particularly the East Coast, was built by a New Yorker. And uh, it was done, hang on, let me get this moving here. Um, and it was done by Henry Flagler. So is Miami an international destination? Is it a national destination or both? And why is Miami what it is? Well, it is a financial, commercial, cultural, media, entertainment, arts, and international trade center, particularly with uh, Latin America, Colombia. I can think of one guy who hosted a TV show, um, Don Francesco, uh, but that wasn't his name. Mario Kutzberg was his name, and he used to come up from Colombia as part of uh, media and entertainment. But this is the guy who actually had the vision of Florida. His name was Henry Flagler. And he was a guy from New York, and he was looking to build an American Riviera. That's Key West, where I took that picture from. And uh, he decided, uh, I want to leave New York in the winter. He was the first who decided to leave New York in the winter. Everybody else would follow him. And he was the guy who really decided that I'm going to build an American Riviera. It's going to be on the Florida coast. I'm going to do it. I have all this money because I'm part of Standard Oil, but I want to go down to Florida because I want to be warm in the winter. And this is what he saw. Well, he didn't probably see this because this is Fort Lauderdale. You probably have seen all of that. But he saw beach after beach after beach. He saw that entire Atlantic coast, and he decided he could make a fortune on top of whatever he had by building the American Riviera. So he was on the board of directors of Standard Oil, which was uh, – John J. D. Rockefeller, and he gives up his day-to-day -day involvement in the corporation because he decides he is going to build something in Florida. Now, Miami was never on his radar, uh, but he ended up in Miami. He started up uh, south of Jacksonville and St. Augustine in 1885 and began the construction of the 540-room Ponce de Leon Hotel. Now, of course, Ponce de Leon was on a different journey back in his day. He was looking for the Fountain of Youth. And if he would have found the Fountain of Youth in Florida, you would have 150 million people in Florida right now instead of the, what, 28, 29 million people you have now. Um, so Flagler gets to uh, St. Augustine in 1885. St. Augustine, of course, is one of the, is a settlement, uh, one of the oldest settlements in North America. And that's the oldest wooden schoolhouse uh, in the United States in St. Augustine, Florida. St. Augustine, one of the first towns ever settled in what is now the United States by Europeans. Um, and there's a Flagler there, uh, again, the city of Augustine, and uh, that's uh, his uh, statue. So he decides, okay, I'm here in St. Augustine. What do I got to do next? Well, he decides, I'm going to buy this small railroad and I'm gonna turn it into something. And we're gonna go as far as the end of the railroad, which is approximately Palm Beach, Florida. It became known as the Florida East Coast, East Coast Railway because he wants to create an American Riviera and he's got it all mapped out. It's gonna be great. He knows what he's doing. He's gonna get all his friends from New York and all the other uh, billionaires at the time and, and tycoons. Uh, from the Gilded Age, and they're going to all come down and join them eventually. West Palm Beach was going to be the end of his railroad system, but weather got in the way. There were freezes in 1894 and 1895. 
And all of a sudden he's beginning to reconsider, why am I down here if it's freezing all the time? I, I, I can't build a Riviera if it's cold. Nobody's going to go swimming when it's 30, 40 degrees. What, is this always like that? So he's, he's in the dither right now because there's this unusual cold weather hitting as far south as West Palm Beach. And he doesn't know exactly what to do, but somebody tells him something. Hey, listen, listen, go down to this place. There's this river down there. Go down there to, on the Miami River. There are two people you need to talk to, Julia Tuttle and William Brickell. He says, go talk to them. And he gets land, he gets land, he gets land. He starts building the railroad tracks. He gets the land from private landowners. Julia Tuttle and William Breckel, he's on his way, and he ends up in what is now Miami. Uh, that's the Breakers. That's a picture of my wife in 2000 at the Breakers in uh, Palm Beach, where all of the rich people would go under Flagler's plan, and they built that up. Uh, but he would eventually see, well, he would eventually see what this is. This is, of course, Fort Lauderdale, and this is from a cruise ship as we were leaving Actually, we're entering Fort Lauderdale on that picture coming back. And this is what uh, Flagler would look at, except it didn't have the buildings or the causeway or anything. Uh, along the way, he encouraged, hey, you need some things to build this place up. Fruit farming, settlements along the railway. And uh, he gave away a lot of gifts because he needed hospitals built. He needed churches built. He needed schools built because it was all part of the infrastructure he needed if he was going to get an American Riviera built. Eventually, he would go down to the Miami area, and that is where the train would end. Uh, it would be the Florida East Coast Railway, and it reached Biscayne by 1886, and the city of Miami would come shortly thereafter. Miami is one of the youngest cities in the United States, believe it or not. It's one of the youngest international cities uh, as well. Uh, Flagler dredged the channel, he built some streets, inst uh, initiated and instituted the water and power supply system, and he told the locals, he said to the locals, hey, you know what, you should use the old Indian name, Miami, or as Ed Sullivan used to say, Miami, and um, that's how Miami became Miami, uh, and Ed Sullivan actually used that name, and Sullivan, of course, is part of this talk as well. Um, this is what he wanted to get people to go to, the beaches, and um, he didn't want the seagulls necessarily in the way, but he wanted people to spend money at his hotels, move down to the area to enjoy the beaches. So Miami and the surrounding areas grew because of tourism, it became a destination for those seeking to flee the colder winter climates. Uh, from the New York area, the joke was Miami was New York City's sixth borough because there were so many New Yorkers who ended up uh, in the Miami area. And then they, had, they got to Miami, Miami Beach, and then they started going back north towards uh, Boca and Boynton and, and uh, Palm Beach County. The area would get a major boost in 1966 because the great one, Jackie Gleason, would move his television show from New York City to Miami Beach in 1966. And that really was the first time that people could watch on TV things from Miami Beach and Gleason was his own chamber of commerce in terms of selling the city. He uh, also did a golf tournament, uh, the Jackie Gleason Open, and uh, he's very instrumental. And that happened in the 1960s. Um, Miami had a few events that people knew about, the Orange Bowl, that uh, football game, college football game started bringing attention to Miami in 1935. World War II came around. They also had the Everglades. My son will kill me if he knows I used this picture of him in the Everglades in 1994 when he was uh, eight or nine years old at that time. But my friend Lipsight, Worlds would collide on February 18, 1964, and Florida already is getting some attention because of the Mercury astronauts blasting off from Cape Canaveral, but this one actually changes culture. And it's in my friend Bob Lipsight. There is Bob, Bob Lipsight. And Bob uh, was, um, 
Okay. Bob was a writer for the New York Times. Bob was on PBS. Bob now gives uh, talks. Uh, he lives out in Suffolk County near the Hamptons and uh, calls me up one day. He says, you know what? What are you sitting around the house for? Why don't you go out and give some talks? Um, you know, you got a lot of stories. We've known each other for over 30 years. And um, he gave me the story about the Beatles meeting Cassius Clay, and he named it When Worlds Collided. And Bob got me out there to do all kinds of talks about all kinds of different things. And he's still out there giving talks. He's still out there writing opinion pieces about the world. Um, you can look up his blog. He's still out there. He's in his 80s now and a thoroughly delightful gentleman. Anyway, Bob is in Florida basically to cover spring training. The New York Yankees spring training is in Fort Lauderdale. He gets a call from his editor at the New York Times. He said there's a big thing that's going to be happening at the Fifth Street gym. Uh, I don't know if you want to, how much you should do it, but we want you there. Um, Angelo Dundee's gym. Uh, Cassius Clay is going to be there and he is going to meet the Beatles. Now Lipside has told me that this could have been the biggest failure ever in his career covering this. Uh, Sonny Liston was supposed to beat Cassius Clay because he was, he was the fiercest, baddest guy in the world, heavyweight champion. And Clay was Clay at that point. He was 22, 23 years old, and nobody knew if he could really handle Sonny Liston. The Bob is waiting with the Beatles in a side room because they wanted Cassius Clay to come out at the same time as the Beatles. He's the only one with the Beatles. He spends a half hour with them because Clay is late. And he said three of the Beatles were actually really good. Paul McCartney, Ringo Starr, George Harrison. All three of them were quiet. They were very nice. They didn't bother anybody. But John Lennon was a troublemaker. And John Lennon was not exactly all that thrilled to meet Cassius Clay. And then he has to wait to meet him. And he, they're getting very, very impatient. And they haven't started living in that box yet. Uh, the box would be coming with this tour where they couldn't go out, where they became four of the five most famous people on earth at that point, or four of the five most famous people. Uh, and Lipside kept saying that uh, Lennon kept saying, I don't know why I'm here. I don't know why I'm here. I shouldn't be here. I'm not, this guy is going to lose. I only associate myself with winners. I never associate myself with losers. He is going to be a loser. Nobody could beat Cassius Clay. Or rather, Sonny Liston. Cassius Clay can't beat Sonny Liston. This is going on for a half hour. Finally, Clay and his entourage enter the Fifth Street gym with Angelo Dundee and everybody else. And these guys never met one another, had no idea. In fact, when Cassius Clay first saw them, he said, who are those four sissy boys? And um, they get there, they line up, Clay stands next to them. There are a whole bunch of photographers there, video is rolling, and showbiz kicks in. Showbiz kicks in. This is one of the famous pictures where Ali just puts his glove out like that, and the four Beatles fall over. There's pictures of Ringo Starr riding uh, Cassius Clay's back. Now, Lipside said a lot of things could have gone wrong with this thing. First of all, the Beatles had only been in the country, the United States, had been on the Sullivan Show for only about a week, week and a half. They could have been one hit wonders or two hit wonders. Actually, they couldn't be. They were, had one through five on the Billboard charts that week were Beatles songs, the only time that's ever happened from the same group. Um, so they could have been five hit wonders. It could have ended just like that. Clay could have lost to Sonny Liston, could have ended just like that, and we would not have had this change, this sea change. Uh, the Beatles, of course, knock out the Frank Sinatra types, the, the Bing Crosby types, even uh, the uh, Elvis Presley types. Clay brings in something different as well. He's an entertainer. Angelo Dundee, who I, I forgot who was in here, who told the story about training at Angelo Dundee's Fifth Street Gym, was telling me a story about 1963. Cassius Clay had won a, a silver medal at the uh, Olympics in Rome in 1960. And he came back and he found out that silver medal meant nothing. And he worked his way up 
the line, worked his way up, worked his way up. And uh, in 1963, he has a fight in Las Vegas. And the night before the fight, he and Dundee are in the room and he's watching professional wrestling. Gorgeous George. Cassius Clay loved Gorgeous George, but it wasn't Gorgeous George who was on. It was Freddie Blassie, who I got to know later on in life, um, to the point where I actually played in a celebrity hockey game in 1987, and Freddie Blassie was my coach, which was hilarious. But Freddie Blassie is on. And if you know anything about wrestling, Freddie Blassie was the ultimate heel. And in wrestling, the heel is the one who actually brings people into the... Uh, into the arena because everybody wants to see the heel lose. And the heel usually has a great sense of humor and he's screaming and yelling and calling attention to himself. Clay looks at Dundee. He said, that's the way we're going to make money, boss. We're going to be just like Freddie Blassie and I'm going to do this whole act. And of course he did the act. He chased Liston all over South Florida. He chased him here. He chased him there. He chased him all over the place. And uh, he had all kind of poetry and everything else in motion. Had he lost, well, that part of the culture might not have changed in sports where all of a sudden it's about me. It's about me selling myself had he lost. Had the Beatles been five hit wonder, which is always possible in the music industry, the British invasion may never have taken place. Be no Rolling Stones, no Who and, and the Hermans and the Hermits and the Kinks and uh, Dave Clark Five and, and all of these groups, and we wouldn't be doing the Freddy had they failed. But neither one of them failed, as Lipside pointed out. And that's why he said it was the collision of cultures, because Ali changed his culture in sports. It became entertainment. The Beatles changed music. The Beatles came from a lineage which started with Al Jolson and Rudy Valley and then Bing Crosby and then Frank Sinatra and then Elvis. Nobody's knocked the Beatles off of the throne. As far as Ali, he's, he became a cultural icon uh, in the 1960s. He decided he was not going to uh, in, uh, be inducted into the armed forces, uh, lost his boxing license, lost his championship, spent three and a half years on the outside. Uh, was supposed to go to jail for evading uh, the draft, uh, and of course he didn't, and uh, that was overturned by the Supreme Court. He was supposed to face five years in jail and a $10,000 fine, um, and he marched in peace rallies, except he really wasn't trying to basically be a protester. This was his own protest. So Lipside said that these two, this event, February 18th, 64, is the beginning of the 1960s. Although some people say beginning in the 1960s was when, Cass was when Kennedy was assassinated. But this is uh, one of those sentimental moments, uh, sentimental moments of the 1960s. And this was not staged. This was five guys looking at a camera and putting on a show for the cameraman and then the audience. Uh, that is me and Ali all those years later. That's in 1985 with me and Ali. Unfortunately, that was the last time I had any kind of conversation with him. Uh, the Parkinson's kicked in, and even then, he barely spoke above a whisper. Uh, in the 1970s, it was Ali and the Cosell show, Howard Cosell, uh, Muhammad Ali. And by the way, I'm still friendly with uh, Colin and Justin. Uh, Howard's grandchildren. Justin comes to some of my talks in Stanford, Connecticut when he can. Uh, Ali and um, Cosell were not friendly. They liked the Beatles. They saw the camera go on and it was showtime. Um, Cosell uh, acknowledged that Ali had a right to say that he was a conscientious objector uh, in 1967. Uh, I'll get to 67 in a minute. Uh, there is me and Ali when I could speak to him. That was 1982, and my mic is back here because I'm asking Ali a question in 1982. This is right after uh, he had retired uh, from the ring, and uh, he could still at least answer questions at that point because the Parkinson's and the punch drunk dementia hadn't kicked in by that point. Dundee had the gym where Cassius Clay trained for the fight with Sonny Liston. It was a Fifth Street gym. And uh, there's Angie, Angelo Dundee, again with my 
son who is eight years old and Angelo put in, uh, filled in the blanks for me. What uh, Lipsight couldn't tell me, Angelo told me about 1964, where the worlds collided. Um, Lennon still, even after Ali won the championship, wasn't all that convinced that Ali was all that he was. Now, if you take a look at that album cover, take a good look at that album cover, and that's Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. If you look to the, uh, it's my left side, it's John Lennon's right side, it's the, the wax figure's right side, you see a figure in Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. That figure is not Muhammad Ali. That figure is Sonny Liston. Each of the Beatles were asked to put their heroes up on the album cover. Ringo said, whatever the other guys want, that's fine with me. Um, so Lennon put up a whole bunch of pictures or a whole bunch of suggestions, including Adolf Hitler, who never made the cut. Uh, he, they sent, they had Mae West, and Mae West said, why would I want to be a member of a Lonely Hearts Club band or society? Um, uh, Leo Gorsi from the Bowery Boys said, I'm not going to do this. But if you look, there is Sonny Liston. And Sonny Liston, there is the uh, cutout of Sonny Liston, as it was supposed to be on Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Heart Club band, Sonny Liston made the cut. Muhammad Ali didn't make the cut. Uh, so Lennon was still thinking about Sonny Liston in 1967 uh, and not Muhammad Ali. Well, the Beatles would split up in 1969, September 20th, 1969, and left the cultural impact. Ali in 1967, April 29th, 1967, was called down to the uh, draft board in Houston, refused uh, entry into the armed services. He would end up losing his title and his boxing license. And in my opinion, for what my opinion is worth, it was done without due process and he was not given an opportunity to explain himself. Uh, he's out there for about three and a half years. He would come back, uh, fight against Jerry Quarry in Atlanta, Georgia, and then would come the big fight between Ali and Frazier at Madison Square Garden on uh, March 8th, 1971. And Ali, the draft dodger in some people's minds, Ali, the hero of the protests in other people's minds, becomes part of society. The Supreme Court would eventually uh, uh, overturn uh, his conviction and he's able to go ahead and have the boxing career he does from 1970 until 1981. Uh, the Beatles were not finished with Ali. That is Jimmy Carter's inaugural on uh, January 20th, 1977. And John Lennon and Muhammad Ali crossed paths again, uh, as did Paul McCartney and uh, Ali. Ali was an interesting character. I'm going to give you a story you probably never heard of. And uh, it was told to me by Shelley Saltman, Ferdy Pacherko's friend. Shelley was... Um, a guy who was uh, a promoter, and he promoted the Ali Frazier fight in 1980, 1971. Among the people he got involved with it was Burt Lancaster, who was the color commentator with Don Duffy on radio. And uh, in uh, 1976, um, Freddie Blassie, who I played hockey with, or he was my coach in hockey, Freddie Blassie is Muhammad Ali's manager in a wrestling versus boxer exhibition in Tokyo, Japan against Antonio Inoki. Inoki laid on the campus and just kicked and kicked and kicked and kicked. Uh, Ali got blood clots in his legs. And afterwards, he was checked out by the doctor. He said, you've got to go to this hospital here in Tokyo. He said, I'm not going. He said, no, you got to go. It's literally a matter of life and death because you got blood clots or you're going to get blood clots. And Ali said, no, nope, I'm going to South Korea. And the reason I'm going to South Korea is I made a promise to the soldiers, to the servicemen, that I was going to put on an exhibition tomorrow night, which it was tomorrow night. And he said, I am keeping that, I'm keeping that. I made that commitment, I'm not breaking that commitment to these men and, and the women who were there. And he went there, he kept it, he had fever, he went in the hospital right afterwards and it was kind of touch and go initially, he had a high fever, he eventually would recover, but he felt it was really important that he put that exhibition on 
for the troops. Now, this is a guy who would have gone into the army in 1967 and would have just put on exhibitions, but he felt 1976 that it was incumbent upon him to do so, and he ended up in the hospital, he recovered, and uh, that's a story you probably never heard of with Muhammad Ali entertaining the troops in 1976, thanks to my friend Shelley Saltman. Now, Walt Disney, how many of you remember the Mickey Mouse Club? Let me give you a very, very thumbnail sketch about the Mickey Mouse Club. Back in um, 1955, 1956, Walt Disney had this idea for a, an entertainment amusement park 40 miles south of uh, Los Angeles in Anaheim, California. Never was able to get the money for it. People would just say, you know, we don't need it. There are so many amusement parks back in the 1950s. Every place had an amusement park. So he's shopping around, he's shopping around, he's shopping around, and he meets with ABC TV. There are only 14 ABC TV stations at the time. They're owned by Paramount. It's a very weak network. It's NBC, CBS at that point. Dumont's about ready to go out of business. And Paramount says to Disney, look, we'll put up some money for this park that you want to build, but you got to do two things for us. One is you got to give us two TV shows. We want to compete with Howdy Doody. We want to compete with Howdy Doody. So can you give us a TV show? Hence the Mickey Mouse Club. And we want another show, a show about Disneyland. He gives them the two shows. They give them the money. Disneyland is built, becomes a success. By the late 1950s, Walt Disney is looking to go somewhere with his amusement park idea. He's looking 95% of the country east of the Mississippi never gets out to California, and he wants to tap into that market with an amusement park. So he goes looking and looking and looking and looking around. And he finally says, why not Florida? And eventually, in 1963-64, he's going to Florida. Of course, he's also working the World's Fair in New York. A lot of what Disney World started out with started at the World's Fair in New York in 1964-65. Florida would welcome Walt Disney as its second resort, again in the 1960s. And he wanted to get that 75% of the population that lived on east of the Mississippi out to California or into one of his products. So he flies over this potential site in Orlando, not too far from Cape Canaveral at that point. And he's in a helicopter overhead and he's looking and he sees the Florida Turnpike being built. He sees Interstate 4 being built. He knows McCoy Air Force is to the east. He knows there's a, a base out toward Tampa out in the other part of the coast on the west coast. And he decides, I got my sight. I'm going to Orlando. With that decision, there's more cultural change in Florida. And there is uh, my, my daughter when she was about two and a half years old, Epcot Center, which wasn't supposed to be, according to Disney, not an amusement area. People were going to live there. That was going to be an experimental place. But it would become an amusement park after Disney died because they didn't want to put the expense into Epcot or other things. It just made it uh, a, a center. The construction would start in 1967. Walt Disney World opened in 1971. And let me ask you, just by a raise of hands, how many of you would go to Disney World today if it was $3.50? Because that's what the price was, $3.50. Sandra says, yes, she would go. Uh, and $2.50 for juniors under the age of 18 and a buck for kids. Now, you got to go to your bank and get a mortgage now to get uh, into Disney World these days uh, because it's so expensive. But that is a place where cultural change, nobody in their right mind in 1963 would ever have thought that Orlando would become an, uh, an international destination or one of the three spots in the United States where people go to New York City, Las Vegas, Orlando, depending on the year two, three, and one, one, two, and three, Orlando. And that all happens in the 1960s when Florida signs a deal uh, with the Walt Disney Company to build this amusement park. The legacy, of course, Orlando and Central Florida become an international destination, which in the late 1950s, well, in the late 1950s, you had Esther Williams uh, down in uh, Polk County uh, 
and and uh, that was uh, oh I can't think of was she skiing and and and, and oh, what is the name of that place? I can't even think. Of. Circus World was down there too, but uh, I went there so many times down in uh, Winter Haven, um, and they were small amusement parks at that point. But uh, Orlando Disney puts Orlando and on the map starting in 1965. Other side of the coast on the uh, East Coast, we choose to go to the moon. May 25th, 1961, John F. Kennedy tells the world that the United States is going to land on the moon by the end of the decade, which could have meant 1970 because technically that was the end of the decade. And there is Kennedy and there is Werner von Wolf, von Braun, Werner von Braun rather, the head of the space program, the NASA space program. Uh, they're both looking at the moon. Yes, Mr. President, that is the moon. You are pointing to the moon. That is the right direction. And to uh, Von Braun's right is the Saturn IV rocket that is designed to take men to the moon. The Gulf Coast, rather the Space Coast, starts about 1959, 1960. That is where the United States chose uh, to launch in a civilian, not really a civilian program, but certainly separated somewhat from the Army, Navy, and Air Force, uh, a program to launch men to the moon, the National uh, Space, uh, the National Aer uh, Aeronautical and Space Administration. Seven Mercury astronauts, six of them make it uh, into space. One doesn't, Deke Slayton, because um, he uh, has a heart problem. Uh, Alan uh, Shepard, the first man in space in May of 1961. Uh, the Gemini program starts in 1963. The Apollo program gets set back until 1968. Uh, the funny thing about Kennedy, had he won, had he lived and uh, not and been reelected, he might not have gotten money for the space program because people were already saying, "Hey, wait, there's so many problems here on Earth. Why are we spending people in space?" Uh, the real reason for the space program: space superiority. If you get to the moon you control space. Um, and it was a race between the Soviets and the United States, which would end in 1969 with Neil Armstrong going to the moon. The first manned space flight by U.S. Air Force crews. Alan Shepard, May 5th, 61. Gus Grissom, July 21st, 1961. The first American to actually orbit the Earth was John Glenn, February 20th, 1962. Yuri Gagarin from um, Soviet Union was the first to orbit the Earth. Soviets had the first satellite in space, the Sputnik. There were three more Mercury orbital flights through May of 63, and then came Gemini. And I cheated on this one because this is from Long Island. This is from Flushing Meadow Park, Queens. That's the Gemini spacecraft. Uh, the mock-up, which was there for the World's Fair in 1964-65. A lot of stuff moved down, uh, including Abe Lincoln from uh, the World's Fair down to Florida. Uh, the first man Gemini flight was in 65, and that was Gus Grissom and John Young. And um, there were a, a number of other flights as well. Um, and the goal for Gemini was to prove they could link up in space, which would be critical for the Apollo missions. And the Apollo mission, the Saturn V rocket, which so is Saturn IV rocket, would be launched from Cape Canaveral at the Kennedy Space Center near Merritt Island. March 9th, 1969, Apollo 9 was the third crewed Apollo mission. And uh, for those from Long Island, uh, it was the first flight of the command module and the lunar space module, which was made at Grumman and Beth Page. And then uh, Beth Page, there's a mock-up of the lunar space module. 14 were made, none of them ever used on Earth. It wasn't made for Earth, it was made for space, so they had to try it out in space. Uh, Apollo 9 uh, worked on the lunar engines, backpack support, navigation systems, docking maneuvers that were needed to go to the moon. There's James McDivitt, David Scott, and Rusty Schweikert, uh, and they did all of that. Uh, Apollo 10, the Snoopy and the Charlie Brown, Thomas Stafford, one of the two astronauts I interviewed, very quiet guy. Air Force General. John Young, uh, Gene Cernan went within eight miles of the moon. There you see out of uh, Young's window uh, before he docks with uh, that craft, uh, which went down to eight miles to the moon to prove that it could almost land on the moon. It was a dress rehearsal on May 18, 1969. Apollo 11. How many of you remember watching Man Walk on the Moon? 
That starts in Florida. That starts in Florida, but the real story is in Australia, but this starts in Florida. As my friend Dick Hull, who now lives near the Kennedy Space Center uh, in Cape Canaveral, and Dick was the engineer who brought the video back from the moon to Earth. And you're gonna hear a story that you probably have never heard before. Uh, it's a story that was a big secret too, until Dick told me that I opened my big mouth and, tell, and told that to people like you. Um, you see that picture there? Everybody can see that picture? Okay, you can see the picture, right? You might notice that Neil Armstrong is upside down. He is upside down. Dick Hull, when Dick Hull is in Australia, and, I, and he tells me the story, well, we got the picture upside down. I said, that's because you're, you're in the land down under. He sees that picture. It comes up about 30 seconds before the world sees the picture. And uh, they're panicking in Australia. What are they going to do? And they get 30, 25 seconds to decide what to do. And Dick says, oh, there's a mirror over there. I'll just put it underneath and nobody will know. His boss said, you put your, that mirror underneath there, uh, you're fired. And he says, if I don't put that window, that mirror underneath that, then you're going to be the laughing stock in the world. It's counting down, and they're getting in panic. And Dick, at the last second, said, hey, wait a minute. We have a new system here. I wonder if somebody didn't flip the switch. With about three seconds to go, they flipped the switch, and you got to see that picture. Uh, that is Neil Armstrong on the moon. Not clear like that, uh, because that was taken on the moon by Buzz Aldrin, who's the other astronaut that I interviewed. Looked just like Georgie Jessel the last time. Remember Georgie Jessel? Toastmaster General of the United States with all that, all the medals and everything back in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. It's what Buzz Aldrin looked like the last time I saw him 10 years ago. But uh, they got it straight now. As Dick said, if we didn't get straight now, everybody would think that it was just a fake and that we never went to the moon. And uh, eventually that would become the ad for MTV. MTV. Um, billions of dollars spent to go to the moon and MTV used it as an advertising or ad for advertising when they started in 1981. The Apollo program would continue through 1972. Five missions would be successful. Apollo 13 never made it to the moon because of an onboard explosion, but it became a big movie. How many of you saw the Apollo 13 movie? And Jim Lovell, who was the commander of Apollo 13, a friend of mine who was connected with NASA said, when Lovell made the movie, Apollo 13 with Ron Howard and Tom Hanks, uh, Lovell went on a publicity tour and uh, started talking to people about the movie. And more people were interested not in how he got back, and they got back. It was miraculous how they got back. They chose 30 options. That was number 30. They, they made it back with that. Uh, but the number one question asked of Jim Lovell on the publicity tour for the Apollo 13 movie was, is Tom Hanks really a nice guy? See, now, if I was with you, you'd all be laughing right now. You all would be saying, well, is he? And the answer is, yeah, he is, according to Jim Lovell. Uh, Congress cut funding for Apollo 18, 19, and 20, the last lunar shot from Cape Canaveral, December 11th, 1971. Gene Cernan was the last guy who walked on the moon. And that's the Apollo 1 spacecraft, Apollo 11 spacecraft uh, that lifted off in um, Cape Canaveral. That was at uh, the Smithsonian Institute. It has been refurbished. It went around the country in uh, 2017, 2018, 2019. And uh, right now it's being prepared to go back to the Smithsonian Institute. The last place it was, the Museum of Flight in Seattle between March and September. Now, how many of you know this? One of these days, Alice, one of these days, bang, zoom, to the moon. Well, Jackie Gleason didn't go to the moon, nor did Alice, Alice Cramden or Ralph Cramden. And, Al, and Ralph never hit Alice, although Alice, if you take a look at that, said, go ahead, try it, do it. But Jackie Gleason, while Alice may never have gone to the moon, Jackie Gleason was instrumental in getting people to Florida and putting people on the map. Uh, in 1964, Jackie Gleason decided to move his CBS TV show to the Miami Beach Auditorium on Washington Avenue. And Johnny Olson became, was his announcer, and he used to open his show. 
from the fun and sun capital of the world, Miami Beach. It's the Jackie Gleason Show. Now, there was a guy named Jim Dooley, and Jim Dooley would do commercials aimed at the Northeast, particularly New York, some Boston, some Philadelphia, some Cleveland, Buffalo, Pittsburgh, Buffalo, Detroit. Come on down. The weather is fine. Jackie Gleason puts Miami on the map, more so than the Beatles, more so than Disney and Disney World, because that was that was an opening up for a while. Um, every week, he has his show there, and people go. He has Frank Sinatra on the show. He has others on the show. He brings back the Honeymooners, an older Jackie Gleason doing the Honeymooners. People would tune in. It was the most popular show on CBS on Saturday nights in the 1960s. And so Miami would be profiled. They got all this free publicity from Jackie Gleason. They did about 30, 32 shows uh, a year at that point, And it would always be the same, how great it is. And, and he, he would show you the beach and they would do things at the beach um, and, and all. Uh, so Jackie Gleason, got a lot of people interested in going to Miami and actually opens up somewhat, opens up somewhat Miami for people to go to Miami and actually do, whether it's TV work, whether it's doing recordings, whether it's doing movies, people went to Miami. Jackie Gleason's protege is Larry King. Larry King meets Jackie Gleason. Uh, Larry's on WIOD at that point and Gleason would call in and uh, Gleason would become, um, Larry King's mentor in many, many, many ways. Uh, Johnny Olson would open the show from the sun and fun capital of the world. It's the Jackie Gleason show. And Gleason would close the show by saying, Miami Beach audiences are the greatest in the world, except most of his Miami Beach audience came from New York. Go figure. But New Yorkers were flocking down there and were beginning to settle into a retirement there. Six years of high visibility show business down in Miami. The show would end in 1970, but Miami would also become known for something else, the Super Bowl. I that story about the Super Bowl. That's my friend, uh, the late, uh, the late Shelly Saltman. Shelly passed away on February 16, 2019. You might know Shelly from this. He was Evil Knievel's promoter. He was also a promoter with Ali and it was in Ali's inner circle until he quit 1979 because he was totally afraid for Ali's health later on. And he and Ferdy Pacherko were the first two guys to get out of there saying, Muhammad, it's time to quit. Muhammad wouldn't do it. This is in the Los Angeles area. This is 2015. And um, the other thing you might know Shelley for was uh, he promoted Evil Knievel's Snake River Canyon Jump. And he wrote a book called Fear No Evil, where he talked about the anti-Semitism of Evil Knievel, what a bad guy Evil Knievel was. Evil Knievel decided to get even with him. You might remember this. He took a baseball bat. He, he and a friend took a baseball bat to the Fox Studios. Shelley was the president of Fox Sports at the time in the 1970s. I uh, took a uh, baseball bat with him and wandered into the place, gets past the guard, goes in the building holding a baseball bat. Nobody asked him why he held the baseball bat. He went into Shelley's office, beat Shelley to a pulp uh, with the baseball bat. Uh, Shelley would eventually recover, sue him for $13 million, and uh, never saw a penny of that. Evil could evil hid that so well that forensic people couldn't find it. Um, but there's another story here, and it's Jackie Gleason, and it's the golf tournament down in, uh, I guess it's Doral, was it? Doral. And uh, Shelley promoted uh, golf tournaments for his clients, which included Glenn Campbell and Andy Williams. Um, and, uh, and I tell a story about Andy Williams and how his best friend was Bobby Kennedy, and the day that Kennedy was assassinated, he wrote his final two speeches in Los Angeles at Shelley's desk. But this is a fun story. Um, Shelly's promoting the Jackie Gleason thing, and Shelly is looking at Jackie Gleason's vest. And he's looking at it, and he's looking at it, and he's looking at it. And Jackie said, uh, what you looking at? I said, your vest. He said, you like it? He said, oh, I think it's great. He says, you want one? He says, yeah. He said, I'll get you one. So he said, well, where are we going to get? He said, come with me. Goes to a car, 
They get in the car together. Jackie Gleason is driving, 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 driving. And they get to a storage area. It's a big storage area. And um, Jackie has a, has a suite there. There's a suite in the storage area, whatever it's called. And opens the door. And Shelly, he says, he, what size you take? He said, I take a 44. 44. He says, come with me. So he's got this door. And on the door, it says, I wish. I-W-I-S-H. I wish. And he opens the door, and it looks like size Sims. Filled with clothes in all different sizes. And Shelly's looking. He says, you're 44? He said, go pick it out. And he goes there, and there's this, the best. He says, you want? You have. He says, oh, thanks. He says, what is, what is this I wish thing? He says, oh, the sign on the door, I wish. I wish I could fit into everything in this room. Jackie Gleason, the ambassador for Miami Beach in Miami, getting people there. Gleason hosted his golf tournament. He introduces Larry King to the world by constantly being a guest on his local show. That is me with Joe Namath in 1988. If you're a New York Jets fan, you know what happened in 1969 on January 12th, 1969 at the Miami Orange Bowl behind Joe next to Bruce Morton there. I'm the guy with curly blackish hair there. Here today, God tomorrow, not there anymore. Uh, is we view back down in the corner behind Bruce, the coach of the Jets. And this was the 20th anniversary uh, of the Jets winning the 1969 Super Bowl over Baltimore, 16 to 7. It is in Miami where the football world changes and where football really enhances itself as America's game. Every Sunday, on any given Sunday, men would flock to the TV and it would become Monday night and Thursday night, football, 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 football. And that guy in the middle who lives near Jupiter, Florida now, Joe Namath, and you probably know him now if you watch any TV for, so, uh, for Medicare Enhancement Insurance. That's what he's doing after posing uh, for pantyhose in his career. Anyway, uh, in a commercial. Anyway, here I am talking with Joe about what happened on January 12th, 1969, but it's more than January 12th. New York Jets, the American Football League team, beat Oakland and get to the Super Bowl, Super Bowl three, becomes known as Super Bowl that year, wasn't known as the Super Bowl in Miami when the second game was played in 1968 or the first game, which was in Los Angeles in 1967, American Football League, National Football League championship game. Uh, the game becomes the Super Bowl. And Joe Namath starts the parade a bit earlier in the week. Uh, if you went to that game, you could still get tickets up until the kickoff, which was 4 o'clock. If you were there at noon thinking about going to the football game, you could probably go and get a ticket. What people didn't know, that the football industry and American culture was about to change between four o'clock in the afternoon and seven o'clock in the afternoon before their very eyes. There would be a huge, huge sea change. There is me and Pete Rozelle. Pete Rozelle, commissioner of the uh, National Football League at the time, and also at the time of this in 1986, and uh, even wore ties back in those days. Hot day in June, 1986. That was in um, Forbes Mag Fortune magazine. And uh, I was covering the USFL NFL trial at that point, and I just got finished talking to Pete, and Pete's talking to somebody else at that time. Pete uh, was a commissioner of the National Football League, and he watched this game change his trajectory. Uh, he admitted that the Jets' upset that day mushroomed the interest in football. That's my wife uh, on the Orange Bowl, 1982. You could still walk in the Orange Bowl, and nobody stopped you. The real, uh, the real suspense in the Super Bowl starts about oh, four or five days earlier. Joe and the Jets fly down to uh, Fort Lauderdale, and they train at Yankee Stadium, or where the Yankees uh, train. Joe got Mickey Mantle's locker. Why? Because they thought they were going to give him some luck. Uh, he and Jim Hudson, who is with the Jets, safety, walk into a bar. And they see Lou Michaels, 
was with the Baltimore Colts. And I'm going to give this story from Lou's point of view, not Joe's point of view. And Lou uh, sees Joe, and first thing he's impressed with or not impressed with is Joe walks into this place wearing a fur coat. As Lou said to me, he's wearing a fur coat in Miami, a fur coat in Miami. Joe walks in with Hudson and then walks out and then walks back in. And he does the Ali thing. He sees Lou Michaels, and he says to Michaels, we are going to kick your you-know-what on Sunday, and I'm going to be the one to do it. Well, Lou Michaels can't believe it. You know, he says he thought Joe would have a lot more class than that, that he would just come over and say, hi, I'm Joe Namath. I'm with the Jets. Lou Michaels' brother, Walt Michaels, was the Jets' defensive coordinator, and they looked alike. They were a couple of years apart, but they looked alike. Um, so they go back and forth and back and forth. And Lou says, listen, I'm not going to get to a fight with you. They walk away. Joe walks away. Joe ended up paying for their drinks that night. The game comes on Sunday. The other thing about Lou Michaels, Walt Michaels is the defensive coordinator with the Jets. They make a uh, $5,000 bet between them. They're going to keep the winner's share or the share, the loser's share rather, of the pot in that uh, it was $8,000 guaranteed. 8000 if you lost $5,000 more if you won. So they make the bet. Uh, they were from Sawyersville, Pennsylvania. And they agreed that whoever gets the $5,000 would give it to the local church because the local church needed to, they needed some, some stuff going on there, in fact, to fix up the church. And uh, so Lou is insulted by Namath, makes this bet, Jets win. The real loser of Super Bowl three is Lou Michaels because he gets insulted by Namath. Walt Welsh is on the bet. The $8,000 becomes $3,000 because Lou pays the $3,000. The Jets win the game. So the big loser of the Super Bowl, Lou Michaels. The big winner, the National Football League, because the Super Bowl would become the unofficial holiday where people would have parties in their house and the Super Bowl commercials and, and who, who's playing the Super Bowl halftime show. At this particular game, the pregame show, uh, the three astronauts from Apollo 8 put circled the moon, which was uh, Frank Borman and uh, Bill Anders and Jim Lovell, led the crowd in the Pledge of Allegiance. There was a trumpet player from Washington who did the national anthem. Al Hurt had done the national anthem in Los Angeles, was unavailable. So they got this guy who's the first trumpet player from the Washington Symphony to do uh, that. And the halftime show is the marching band of Florida A&M. Uh, and that was it. You know, the Super Bowl that you see today has no resemblance to the Super Bowl that you saw on January 12, 1969. But it was in Miami where the whole culture of football and the Super Bowl and the Super Bowl holiday would start in Miami. So all of a sudden in the 1960s, Miami and Florida would be the center of cultural change that, uh, wouldn't, uh, that you wouldn't imagine. Now, baseball had always had a presence in Miami. That's me and Yogi Berra, 2006. Some of you guys, some of you in, the, in this crowd probably wouldn't mind owning those baseball cards. The museum probably wouldn't have mind owning those cards also. They were one of a kind, and uh, they were all stolen. And there's um, Yogi, and I spoke a lot at Yogi's place. Uh, one of the proudest things that I could say about the American icon that I knew when I spoke there, he would come. He would make sure he was there every time that I spoke. Afterwards, he'd tap me on the, on the rear end. Good job, kid. Good job. And then we would eat a sandwich in in there in his office and uh if uh for some of you who might want to know some of those cards willie mays is there and uh casey stingle don larson uh roger maris couple of mickey mantles uh, roberto clementi is there ted williams uh whitey ford and norm seaburn for whatever reason norm seaburn is there as well uh i had known yogi for quite a while and uh I was very happy speaking at Yogi's place, especially when I got that tap on the back. Spring training started in Florida in 1888, a Washington team in Jacksonville, Florida. Um, that was the first time. Uh, it would be a few more years before they'd go back. That's the old Miami Stadium that's not there anymore. 
Um, when I was a kid, I was taken there. Uh, I was about three years old. I was told that I met Wes Stock, who was playing for the Baltimore Orioles at the time, and he gave me an autograph. I have no idea where that autograph is these days. Uh, in 1903, Jacksonville. Why? Because of... Um, of Flagler and uh, St. Augustine, Jacksonville, right near St. Augustine, Jacksonville, was uh, the home of the Philadelphia A's preparing for baseball. Rube Waddell may have ruined that experience because he wrestled with an alligator. He might have tried to commit suicide. That's what they thought. Uh, he was jilted by a woman. Florida just didn't work out, and they didn't come back to Florida for a while after that. Spring training in Florida begins in 1913 in the Ernest Chicago Cubs in Tampa, which was a built-up city at that point. Uh, Cleveland in Pensacola. Well, Tampa was more built up. There was nothing in Miami at that point. One year later, two other teams moved to Florida for spring training. That is the start of the Grapefruit League. Some musicians found Florida in the 1970s. Eric Clapton did uh, 13, 461 Ocean Boulevard. He is the first. The Bee Gees would end up there. The music industry set up all kind of recording studios there in the 1970s. There he is, <laughs> Don Francesco, uh, Mario Kutzenberg. The biggest show in South America was known as Sabato Giganti. It was done in Miami. He came up to Miami to do it. Uh, he started in the 1960s, 1960s, but uh, he came up to Miami. And uh, he was the first of the South American shows that uh, came up to Miami. Miami has become the uh, center for the Spanish speaking television networks in the United States and some in uh, South uh, America, along with music. Telemundo, Telefutura, Galavision, Mega TV, Univision, Univision Com uh, Communications Inc., Universal Music, Latin Entertainment, RCTV, International, Sunbeam Television, some of the uh, companies that called Miami home. KC and the Sunshine Band uh, also started in Florida. I think KC was from Hialeah and uh, still going strong today. Uh, shake your booty. Of course, some of the people if they, from those days, if they shake their booty, might break something off their body. Uh, Gloria Estefan, of course, in the Miami Sound Machine uh, as well. Cultural change as well. Disco was big. Uh, and part of it was because of KC and the Sunshine Band in the 1970s. And of course, Gloria Estefan. Television, Miami Vice, a show I never watched, but I know people who did watch it and loved it. Um, and uh, that brings Miami back into the consciousness of people uh, in the 1980s because there's a television show uh, based out of there. And uh, the Miami Heat paid tribute uh, last year or two years ago to uh, Miami Vice by having Miami Vice uh, uniforms. Gloria Estefan, uh, the Miami Sound Machine out of uh, South Florida as well. And there's the uh, Dwayne Wade in the... Uh, Miami uh, uniform of the time two years ago, paying homage to uh, the Miami Vice TV show. KC and the Sunshine Band, get down tonight. That's the way I like it. Shake your booty. I'm your boogeyman. Miami now is an international capital. Orlando is an international flight center. Uh, Miami, uh, prior to uh, Gleason getting there uh, in terms of sports, uh, there really wasn't very much there. Baseball spring training was it. The Miami Dolphins football team came there in 1966. Of course, there was college football uh, with Florida and uh, Florida State, and the University of Miami um, in those days. Uh, but uh, there wasn't a very much going on in Miami. It was just a, a vacation destination, particularly for people from the Northeast and the Mid-Atlantic states. And uh, in a way, Flagler built it up. And um, all these years later, uh, 100, what, 14 decades later, um, Florida is a major destination for people getting at snowbirds. You all know who the snowbirds are, including me occasionally. Uh, so Flagler did his thing. Uh, Disney did his thing. Jackie Gleason did his thing. The National Football League, the Super Bowl, was literally born in Miami. Uh, the Beatles, 
Cassius Clay, according to Robert Lipsight, that was the cultural event of the 1960s uh, and changed, changed a lot of things. Um, people got away from short hair. Ali was brash and, and loud. Um, so there were so many things. And of course, man started his journey uh, to the moon from Florida as well and Walt Disney World, which opened in 1971, was in the 1960s, but was conceived in the 1960s. So uh, as Lipside said, cultures changed in Florida. And they did. Uh, any questions, any comments, anything you might want to add to what I said? You can open it up. Anybody? Anybody has a question? Or oh, anything to add, or stories, that, or stories that they might want to add. Please raise your hands and you can unmute yourself. Hold on, let me just make sure. You can unmute yourself, but please one at a time and raise your hands. Thank you. Yeah, let's get rid of the PowerPoint so we can see everybody. I can see everybody now. Okay, go ahead. Ask your question. Can you Mr. hear me? Norman, yes. Um, when did uh, Gus Grissom die in the explosion? Uh, and which Apollo was that? That was Apollo 202, actually. That was January in uh, 1967. I'll give you a little background on that from my friend Richard. Um, the problem, as Richard said, was the whole spacecraft was wired poorly. They were pumping pure, pure oxygen in. And he says, this was a dress rehearsal. There was no reason that uh, this should have happened. Richard was on Richard was on the flight and actually listened in to as this thing is going on. He said, you don't ever want to hear the last words that they had. Uh, they were literally incinerated. Um, Dick said that when they went up there, uh, they looked and they couldn't tell the bodies from the spacesuits from what was burnt on the inside. And it was basically, they didn't wire it correctly. Now, Dick told me, the fact that we got to the moon, and, and I have other friends who were at NASA, but Dick would, was more free with uh, his information. He said, the fact that we ended up on the moon, we being the Americans, is nothing short of miraculous since they cut every corner to get up there. Uh, Alan Shepard, uh, when he blasted off in 1961, uh, <laughs> one of his jokes was, you realize that we're sitting, that I'm sitting on a rocket built by the lowest bidders because government mm. had to give to the lowest bidders. And Dick said that uh, the fact that we made it to the moon, it was nothing short sure of miraculous. And in fact, Apollo 7, which was Wally Shiraz's group with uh, Cunningham and Isley, Walter Cunningham, Don Isley, they almost struck. They didn't think the craft was safe enough after all the revisions uh, for October of 1968 for Apollo um, 7. And uh, Dick said that, um, it never should have happened, but Rusty Schweiker, who was on a subsequent flight, rather Michael Collins, who was on a subsequent flight, said that it was a good thing that happened on the launch pad instead of out in space, because they did make all these revisions, because it would have happened in space, they really would not have known what happened. So he said, it was a tragedy that it happened. However, out of the tragedy, they learned something. But that was, I think it was January 27th or 29th, 1967, Apollo 202. And uh, they were supposed to go into space uh, in about three weeks later, February 1967. It's Roger Chafee, Edwin White, and Gus Grissom were the three. Hi, Wendy. Anybody else? Wendy? Sandy? Sam, go ahead. Uh, I, Hi, Sam. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. I'm sorry. I came in late. I don't know if you mentioned it, but I've heard Miami called the capital of Latin America. Yeah, now it is. Right. <laughs> and now I it also is. want to ask you about your friend uh, Richard or Dick. Dick what Hull? was his last name? H-O-L-L. -L, Dick Hull. H-O-L-L. -L. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you. Very good. Yep. Dick Hull. 
Dick was upset last year because, or, yeah, last year, his 50th anniversary, and nobody invited him to a 50th anniversary party. So I said, get out there. Make calls. Well, yeah. Dick, yeah, Dick is now in his late 80s and uh, has some problems connected to being in his late 80s. So, so he gave me this talk. I did a talk last year about the lunar landing. Um, and uh, unfortunately, because he's in his late 80s, he really couldn't give the talk, but Dick was a fascinating reference for me because he was one of the first employees NASA ever hired. Wow. And so he was there through the Mercury, through Gemini, through Apollo. He knew all of the figures from Hidden Figure, he worked with them, and he said wow. the Hidden Figures was very accurate if he saw that movie. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. That's a great movie. Marcia, are you on? Oh, no, no, I was just listening. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, I was the one who mentioned that I that I uh, took boxing lessons at the Fifth Street Gym. So you uh -huh. you recognized Angie? Uh, yes, and uh, it, it, it was wonderful. And the first time I saw no air conditioning, it was amazing. I changed from my business suit into my shorts, ran around, <laughs> and then went to the as I told you about the ladies' room. They had to make a room for the women. And it was L A D Y apostrophe S, and they made. That, that sounds like Angie. That sounds yeah. just like Angie. Did Did he give you the little boxing glove keychain? Oh, I don't. I don't think I got that. No, no, no. Oh, no. okay. <laughs> it was a great place. It was a shame it was torn down. Yeah. Anybody, Anybody else? else? <laughs> Don't be shy before we leave. Get your questions now. Afterwards, once uh, Evan is uh, back in his home. <laughs> I'm, I'm just going from this room to the next room. So and, uh, you know, that's it. It's not, it's not exactly why. It's not exactly a, a, a big stretch. You don't stretch need to travel that. far. We get it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a one-time shot. Brother, you have a question? What was the name of the writer or the person that was there with, the, with Cassius Clay and the Beatles? Robert Lipsight. L, how do you spell Lipsight? L-Y-P-S-I-T-E. Robert Lipsight. Okay. And he's got a book. Yeah, that's uh, right. I and, wanted to look him up. Yeah, look him up. He's got a book. It's, I think it's called Accidental Sports Writer. Um, and he's, um, it, it's, it, it talks about, the, it, it, there are a lot of stories in there. And he ended up on PBS, hosting a show on PBS extraordinarily literate um, and very, very nice guy, extremely nice guy. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna look him up. That's, an, that's a very good story. I didn't know that story. That's a great story. Oh, with, with lips, yeah, get the book. If you get the book, um, you'll, if you get the book, you will, uh, he has that and a lot of other stories. I mean, I, I, I would suggest to you, yeah, get the book. It's, it's extremely uh, interesting. Lipsite, uh, uh, Lipsite, if you look him up now online, you could see what he's doing on his blog, which is, which is interesting stuff at this point. Uh, uh, Lipsite for sports fans who are college sports fans coined the term jockocracy, which Howard Cosell uh, lifted from him. Um, <laughs> I use one of Howard's words because I can't think well, of one of Howard's. I, I, you know, I, I grew up when Howard Cosell was working at WABC. So, I, I mean, I, I grew up watching Howard Cosell and his relationship with Muhammad Ali. And it's all part of my, my background and my history. I think it's one of the reasons why I decided to go into media. <laughs> Howard, uh, Howard, was an <laughs> Howard was an interesting character. For some reason, he took a liking to me. I was uh, 27, 28 years old at the time. And he actually took a liking to me and we became friendly. And I'm still friendly with uh, three of his grandkids, so um, which I find highly amazing, actually. <laughs> Definitely defined the business in many ways. He, uh, Howard, Howard once told me, and we were talking one day, I, and I'm doing a TV talk on Saturday. If you want to tune in, it's at Irvington Library at 1030 on Saturday morning, and I'm doing a, a, a talk on the early days of TV, uh, which is all about the early days of TV. And uh, <laughs> Cosell actually was the one who prompted me to do that because uh, we're at uh, Gallagher's, which was on 8th Avenue and 52nd Street. He didn't tell me to do this talk, but it came out of this talk. 
And, um, and Howard and I walk in together. We just happen to walk in together and says hello. And Gallagher's isn't open yet. And um, we're in a side room there. And he's looking at me. And he says, do you know when they write the history of TV, they're going to write about the three C's. Cronkite, Cosell, and Cosson. And not necessarily in that order. <laughs> and, and I got to thinking about that one day. And I said, you know what? I'm going to start the talk and base the talk on that and prove Howard is either right or he's wrong. <laughs> he's either right or wrong. And so what I did basically was I, I start with that premise, is Howard right or wrong, and work backwards and then work forwards about the early days of TV. And it, and it works out rather well, all because Howard, and, and you got to understand one thing, Howard went on after this, and people are starting to walk into the place, and his voice is at this level, and as people are walking into the place, it goes up to there. <laughs> and, and, you know, I, I had been with Howard so much that it was like, oh, okay, you know, no big deal, no big deal at all. Um, so uh, Howard, uh, it's Friday, it's Saturday, um, if you want to, it's 10.30 in the morning, it's the early days of TV, which I talk about, uh, and that's all because of Howard. Uh, Saturday, Irvington, New York Library at uh, 10.30, and you can go to Evan, the one of our members would like to know if you have a blog. Yeah, I do. Um, yeah, um, it's, uh, just look me up, uh, Evan Weiner. And then you'll hit news because it'll come up on news or okay. speaker that'll come up. Uh, also tomorrow, I'm, uh, I'm doing a talk on, on baseball and the American culture for the Milburn, New Jersey Library, also Zoom. Milburn? Um, if you Milburn? want to, uh, and, and that, that's about the, the culture of baseball. It has nothing at all to do with the game of baseball. It's take me out to the ball game, Casey at the bat, who's on first, Mr. Ed, the Munsters. Uh, the movies, um, Mrs. Robinson, it's, it's about that stuff. It's mm -hmm. not about, I, I, if you could ask me about who won the World Series, not about that at all. Not about that at all. So. Could you just repeat how we can get on that um, Zoom? Tomorrow? At, no, Saturday. The Saturday. It's Irvington, I-R-V-I-N-G-T-O-N, Irvington, New York, because it's in Irvington, New Jersey, Irvington, New York Public Library, and go to the website, and it's 1030, and that's about the early, that's about Cosell, and, the early, and Jackie Gleason, I got Jackie Gleason stories as well, not the one that you heard today about Shelley and the I Wish, which is probably didn't know about I Wish, I wish I could fit into that, <laughs> uh, and, and all, so anybody else? You didn't mention the Bee Gees. Well, that came later. Oh, that's oh, that's true. I'm sorry. That's that right. Came late. That came in the 1970s. Yes. Um, Go ahead. Yeah, you uh, you didn't mention uh, Arthur Godfrey and what role he played. Yeah, he did play a role with the uh, yeah going down there in the airplanes and all that. Uh, you know, it's funny. My my daughter-in-law comes from um, Aventura, and uh, one day I was talking about Arthur Godfrey. And, uh, and, and Godfrey, yeah, he, he has a role in all that, but, and, and there are some good things and bad things about him. I said, do you know who Arthur Godfrey is? She said, no, it's the causeway over there. <laughs> uh, older people would know. You want an Arthur Godfrey story? I'll give you one. I worked at WNEW. How many New Yorkers are here? Right here. Okay, so you know WNEW Radio, right? Channel 11, wasn't it? Yeah, 1130 on your, what? Oh, TV was five. Five, Turn channel five. five. Talking about channel the radio, WNEW -W -W radio. Uh, oh, my right. first scoop in 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 uh, journalism was in 1978. It was in March of 1978. I'm 21 years old, and I do an interview with John Lindsay for a local radio station, Feed It AP, UPI, and uh, they take it. And then I get a call from WNEW radio, Henry Mark Cotton, I'm 21 years old. He said, can we get that story from you? I said, yeah, how much are you going to pay? Ten bucks. Sold. So <laughs> I'm, I'm with WNEW for about three and a half years. And Julius LaRosa, 
ah. was, ha, ah, who, 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 who side with Julius LaRosa? I, I, I remember. <laughs> yeah, Julius LaRosa is, was one of the nicest men you ever want to meet. He was so nice. He was, he was a sweetheart, absolute sweetheart. Um, my friend Shelly knew him, and they were in Palm Springs, and he says, oh, Julius says hello, and I hadn't seen Julie in a long time. So how's Julie? He says, Julie is part of a prestigious club now with Jerry Vale. I said, oh, yeah, what's that? He says, they're, they're part of the Romeos. You know what the Romeos are? Retired old men eating out. <laughs> anyway, so I got to know Julie from WNEW and also covering sports Mets. And he would sing the national anthem at Mets games. And uh, nice guy, hell of a nice guy. And so he's, uh, we're talking one day, and I said to him, I said, you don't mind talking about what happened to God with Godfrey, because I read just recently that you were the only guy in showbiz who visited him on his deathbed. And he said, yeah. I said, so what happened? He said, it was a total misunderstanding. He said, I was leaving. I was leaving, and Arthur didn't fire me. I was leaving, and the words came out wrong with Arthur. And he said, I was a hotshot kid. I thought I was going to have it made at that point. And he said, and it kind of came out misconstrued, and everybody took that that Arthur fired me. Arthur didn't fire me. Um, I left Arthur because I, I was very popular. And then he told me, he said, yeah, it is true that I was the last guy uh, or the last person, the only person in show business that showed up at uh, Arthur's uh, funeral. Um, and um, so, um, yeah, uh, that was that. So that's the Arthur Gottfried story. Mm -hmm. uh, Arthur, uh, and with my story with Arthur, with Julius. And, and uh, Marsha, Julius was the nicest guy in the world. Absolute yeah. nicest guy in the world. I mean, here I'm 22 years old. He doesn't have to talk to me, and yet he's talking to me. You know, I, you know, I'm just a kid. You know, I'm a kid wet behind the ears. Although I had a big scoop, uh, a huge scoop, as a matter of fact. <laughs> he didn't have to talk to me, and he did spend time with me. I remember him. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes, Mr. Uh, Shulman. What's your first yeah. name? Cliff. 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 Okay, Cliff. When, when did Flagler decide to build the railroad down to Key West and why? 1895, after, why? The, after the frost. Why did he want to build a, a road to nowhere, a railroad to nowhere? He wanted to build the American Riviera. He had okay. a lot of money, and he liked going to Florida. It was nice and warm, and you know he, he was with Standard Oil, so money was no object to him. Absolutely no object. So, you know, Florida was sort of built up in Jacksonville and St. Augustine down to, to Palm Beach. It was mostly orange groves and all, and he saw a lot of potential. I mean, you know, he's one of these guys who saw an awful lot of potential and decided, hey, why not? And he had the means. Anybody else? Let me see, I got one here on chat. Oh. Going once, going twice. Anybody okay, has Okay, let me question? type a message in the Zoom chat so you could see where you could find me. And I'll give you my email. Okay. And uh, I do have, uh, you look up this or this. or this, you will find all kind of stuff on me uh, and, and, and all. Uh, so tomorrow, if you're interested, I got the baseball talk. That's the Milburn. I'll write it out. And um, Saturday, so I only have about 35 of these talks. So uh, I just wrote up a talk about, which is actually a little biographical, about 1980, because that was the year that uh, I ended up interviewing Ronald Reagan and interviewed Ted Kennedy and showed up at the National Democratic Convention. And I was heavily involved with the New York State uh, senatorial race with uh, Al D'Amato, who to this day I have a relationship with, um, and Carol Bellamy and Liz Holtzman. Um, 
and uh, Jacob Javits. Uh, the one I missed that year was Bess Meyerson. I don't know how I missed her, but I did miss her. Uh, I've known uh, the Cuomo since 1978. I've known Andrew Cuomo is two years younger than me since he's 19 years old. Um, mm -hmm. All did from you know 1980. And uh, I was in 1979 covering a lot of uh, democratic things, getting rid of Jimmy Carter as well. Um, Jack Kemp uh, and I, I, I sometimes think that the best part of my journalistic career was over by 1981 because I was exposed to just everything back then, working for a 500 watt station or WNAW. And uh, I was going through the other day, I was showing my wife, I said, oh, this is an article I wrote about Daniel Patrick Moynihan 42 years ago. And she looked at it and she said, you wrote that when you were 21? I said, yeah. She said, wow. I don't know. Just did. Did you? Uh, anyway, so if you look at all that, um, you'll find me. And uh, I hope uh, Simone and uh, and Mabel, you don't mind that if these people want to see me doing other talks that won't coincide or co conflict with That's this. That's what we're doing mind. here, exactly. Brother, yeah, you have another uh, question. Hopefully, you hopefully you could show up uh, at either one of them. Uh, I am also doing a talk uh, in Glen Rock, New Jersey, a uh, week from tomorrow. I don't know the time. I'll put it up there. Uh, it's a it was supposed to be live, but it's not. Um, I mean, I was supposed to be there talking about the anniversary of Kent State and uh, 1970. Uh, another person who I knew and interviewed was Richard Nixon over the years. Um, which I get to talk about in that talk. Did I know Bella Abzug? Uh, let me tell you how, about <laughs> Bella Abzug. My aunt, Pearl Berkowitz, was her chief of staff. <laughs> it was quite a character. Who, me or, 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 or Bella? She was- Yes, probably both. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Nothing she, tells me that both. It, it's funny because my, my, you might have heard of my cousin who died today, Jerry Stiller. Yeah. Oh, no. oh, was he your cousin? Uh, yeah. There is. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Um, I grew up watching Stellar Mirror. Yeah, yeah right. Stellar Mirror. And, and, and if you listen to my TV talk, which is, what, Saturday, I incorporate Jerry's stories into that that he told me uh, about Ed Sullivan. And uh -huh. uh, they're great stories. Um, they were on about 40 times. And um, Ed loved them. And... Um, Jerry, Jerry had a problem with my son's name. He couldn't remember my son's name. And he would see me and he would say, how's the boy? How's the boy? How's the boy? I said, I don't know. How's your boy? He lived on Riverside Drive. Yes, Sam. Um, you mentioned Jerry. I'm sorry about the loss. Jerry Stiller. I, I just had a motorcycle pass by and your dad looked. Speak again. Jerry Stiller. Jerry Stiller, yes. I remember seeing them uh, at, with Ann Mira on Ed Sullivan when I was yeah. young. And I thought he mentioned that Ann Mira came from East Flatbush, from East 43rd Street, I, I think. I don't know. I don't know. I know they, met, they met in college. Oh, okay. They met Because I college. lived on the next block, on the dead end street of Troy Avenue off of Snyder. Oh, okay. You know, yeah. East he, Flatbush. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> I, was, I was amazed to hear that she came from my neighborhood. I'll tell you a quick story. Um, we're at the Transit Museum in Brooklyn, and Jerry's father was a streetcar conductor. Wow. And Delancey Street, Delancey Street. And Bill, his name was Bill. He died at the age of 101 at Bather's Rest Home in Spring Valley, New York. And he kept getting married again because he always wanted to be married and outlived everybody until the last one who outlived him. But anyway. <laughs> Bill was 101 years old, and his biggest disappointment in life is all the stillers are short. And my side, yeah, I'm six feet tall. I'm a giant for a stiller. But uh, his biggest disappointment in life was he was too short to be a train conductor, subway conductor. Mm -hmm. anyway, so we're at, uh, my friend Stan Fischler wrote a book about the Third Street L. This is for New Yorkers who remember the Third Street L. Anybody remember the Third Street L? So, which was knocked down for the force train. And so Jerry had just changed his phone number. And if you're Jewish, you will get this in a second. 
So Jerry had just changed his phone number. So he decides to give us a card. And I'm taking out my wallet. And he opens the wallet to get a card. And his Star of David falls out the necklace. And my wife picks it up. He says, oh, there it is. I was wondering what I did with it. <laughs> Put it. He kept it in his wallet. His wallet. So anyway, he... Uh, he sent my daughter a fountain pen for her bat mitzvah, <laughs> among other things. So, uh, but uh, he he passed away. I mean, I knew he's been in bad shape because when I had my granddaughter last year, I sent him pictures and stuff. I never heard back from him. So, mm -hmm. uh, but he, uh, if you tune into, if you get the Irvington talk, you will <laughs> you will hear you will hear some of Jerry's stories about Ed Sullivan. Uh, I would say. When, when, when I woke up this morning and I heard about it, I just thought to myself, a life well lived. Yes, that's what I told 92 people. years old, great, yes. a great legacy, a life well, well lived. Yeah, he, he did. A lot and, of happiness uh, to a lot of uh, he never made it as old as my Aunt Jenny, who was 99, and, and Bill, his father. <laughs> I remember uh, after his father passed away, he sent me a card, you know, thank you for your concern and all that. I said, we're family, but there was some problems in, fa in the family when he married uh, Anne that I'm not going to get into very much. Family stories, they're complicated. <laughs> yeah, families are complicated. <laughs> families are very complicated. So uh, This was yeah. great. Anything Sorry, else? Mom, I mean, everybody. I'm not going anywhere. If you have any, anything else, I'm, I'm here. I mean, I'm Send ideas great. to Sherry. Send ideas to Sherry. <laughs> yeah. We need so. to end the session. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.